Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I'm David Pendergrass. I did a two-part interview of Larry Hurtado, Professor Dr. Larry Hurtado, a while back, and I really enjoyed it. I really appreciate his scholarship. I received an email, a question about one of my interviews. I think it was interview part one. And a man named Dr. Devani, he asks me about something said in the interview. In the interview, Dr. Hurtado and I talk about the reasons why perhaps that the earliest Christians thought that Jesus was enthroned. Let me say a quick word about that. If you First, I hope you'll listen to the podcast. I think they're going <laughs> to help you. Interviews with Larry Hurtado, parts one and two. The earliest Christians believed that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. When the word resurrection was used, the Anastasis in Greek, it can mean raised to new life, and we might use the word resuscitate, resuscitate. But when Anastasis was used of Jesus, it is always referring to, it sure seems to always be referring to something quite different from resuscitation, but rather something we call resurrection. Resurrection is where a person dies, their soul leaves their body. God transforms the old body into a new body of the new world to come. So it's similar, but not the same. It's You're recognizable, but at the same time, you're not. And the Jews that did believe in a resurrection thought it was going to happen at the end of time. It was going to be a corporate event. And it was going to be a sign that the new age, the new world had begun. Well, the earliest disciples, who apparently did not believe that, they had to be, all of them had to be convinced, they saw thought that they saw Jesus after his death. They thought they found an empty tomb, which by default would have meant someone stole the body. That's all they would have said, oh, someone stole the body. But the fact that they met Jesus later, and who come in and out of rooms, could eat, could appear and disappear and so forth, uh, meant that he was not the same old Jesus, but that he had a resurrected body. And they didn't believe this at first. They all had to be convinced. But eventually they were all convinced. They all did believe that the resurrection occurred. And when that happened, after he was, he was there for a while, and then eventually, of course, he, he left their presence. The word we typically use for Jesus leaving the presence of the disciples is the ascension. The ascension. It's described in different times. For example, at the end of Matthew's gospel, the ascension is just kind of thrown in there at the very end. Probably because Matthew honestly ran out of scroll. It seems abrupt because it probably was abrupt. You realize all of a sudden he just ran out of scroll. And we know that was not uncommon at all in the ancient world for them to get toward the end and realize their story wasn't finished and they do a quick, concise summary. And Luke's gospel does the same thing. In Luke's gospel, at the end of it, it's kind of it's, it's abrupt. But then he states it again in a different way at the beginning of Acts. In Acts, uh, we see in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus ascends. He goes up into the heavenly realms. It is probably the case, as N.T. Wright and others have argued, I, th- I think persuasively, it is probably the case that when the earliest disciples saw Jesus go into the heavenly realms, or we might call the ascension, it wasn't five miles up in the sky, but he did leave the... He wasn't just walking and walked to a cave and disappeared. He probably did rise to some degree and then left the presence. That they probably understood this so-called ascension as an enthronement scene. That is to say, he's not just leaving them. He's going to be enthroned, to rule over. Because they believed that God, the Father who had raised him up, ruled there as well. So it seems to have been the case that the disciples saw him go into the ascension and realized he wasn't just being raised, but enthroned. That mixed with this so-called Pentecost experience, when the Spirit comes down in Acts chapter 2, he says that he raised him up. What's interesting is, you got to understand, in the ancient world, in first century Judaism, just because someone was raised from the dead, it does not mean they think he's Lord. They could say, any Jew could might have said, sure, Jesus was resurrected. Okay, sounds good. And that's awesome. Good for him. I don't understand that because I thought it was going to happen at the end of time and all the Jews are going to be resurrected, but good for him. 
And that would have been okay. It would have been real special, but it had been okay to say that kind of stuff. But that's not what the earliest Christians said. It's very important what they actually did say. For example, in Acts chapter 2, he, when the sermon is going on and talks about Joel and the Spirit being poured out, in verse 32, Acts 2, 32, he says, This Jesus God raised up, and we are all witnesses of it. He doesn't mean witnesses of the actual raising. He means we're witnesses of the raised Jesus. That is, we saw him afterward. They were not in the tomb when it happened. So we are all witnesses of it, it being that God raised him up. That's the it. We we are witnesses that God raised up Jesus because they had fish with him. They hung out with him. Verse 33, so then exalted to the right hand of God, that means of, of authority, and having received the promise of the Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For David, that's King David, did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Both Lord and Messiah. If you grew up in church, you you read these verses pretty quickly and go, yeah, 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 I get it. But that's a big deal. In fact, right after verse 37, 38, they say, what in the world, what are we going to do? I mean, they became very upset by it. And Peter says, repent, be baptized. The point is a few things. One is he quotes from verse 34 when he says, King David did not send to us heaven, but said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand. That's, of course, from Psalm 10.1. That's the most popular verse alluded to in the New Testament. That is to say, it is of Jesus' resurrection and ascension. It's not the most common, but Psalm 1101, it's certainly one of the most often cited Old Testament passages there is. And I think it is the most popular one pointing to Jesus being exalted. And of course, it is assuming that the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That means have a place of authority, be enthroned. And the earliest Jewish disciples thought that verse applied to Jesus. They thought that verse applied to Jesus. And if that verse applied to Jesus, that Jesus took up a place of authority in rulership, it means he's not just resurrected. He now actually is ruling Lord as well. I'm going to say that one more time, then I'll move on. This is very important. So for some reason, and I'm going to get to the some reason in a second. For some reason, the earliest Jewish Christians thought that Jesus was not just resurrected, though that's awesome enough, that would not make him Lord. It would not make him the Messiah. It would make him really a, a real, real special guy. What they really believed was he was resurrected, and when he was resurrected, God the Father said, now sit at my right hand. That is, that is, take a place of authority, ruling alongside me, rule with me. That rulership, that ruling now means we don't call Jesus just a dude or a really special guy who got a special Christmas treat, but being raised from the dead, and now he's called Lord and Messiah. That's what's absolutely striking is what these earliest Jewish disciples said. Our crucified master that we had fish with and bread with and saw some miracles and cried and sweat and bled and whatever, that that guy died. God the Father raised him from the dead and enthroned him. Well, if he's enthroned and he's now Lord over the universe... Come to find out, they were reflecting on their lives. He'd been saying all along. He called himself the son of man. That son of man is a figure from Daniel 7, who is to rule over the nations. Well, if he really is a ruling Lord, as all Jews believed, this next part, which is if whoever is ruling Lord is worshipped. So the only proper, appropriate response to a ruling Lord is worship. And as Larry Hurtado often says, these earliest Christians seem compelled to worship Jesus. Compelled. And for a long time that bothered me that he said that word because I couldn't find anywhere in the New Testament where it says the disciple says, I got to do it, I got to do it. But I think what Larry means is, of course, is they feel morally obligated to worship him because of a belief they have about him. So in that interview with Larry Hurtado, I said all of this very quickly because I know he knows the background and all that. But I'm giving some context. So I asked Hurtado, I said, 
Obviously, since resurrection does not mean you're enthroned and not Lord, why do you think they came to that belief? I know in his writings, Larry Hurtado says, I think the reason why they came to the belief that he was ruling as Lord is because they had religious experiences that told them that. That's what Hurtado says. So in the question, when the email sent an email to me to ask the question, uh, he asks this question about the resurrection for this email, all the way back to where I first started. <laughs> and so the questioner asks me uh, these very powerful religious experiences. He says, quote, how might the communal upper room encounter with the Holy Spirit described in Acts 2 relate to this, if at all? Was it the resurrection appearances and or Pentecost 40 to 50 days later that might in part account for such experiences? And while I'm at it, what about the ascension, which happened in between? That had to freak somebody out. <laughs> I realized, of course, that this podcast is focused, uh, apart from some other things, on the New Testament historical scholarship. So he just he knows it might be off topic and so forth. But anyway, it's not off topic. It's a great question. So you're asking me, Dr. Tavani, that you wrote me, you're asking me, are these other events, uh, are they related to these, quote, very powerful religious experiences? It seems to me the answer is yes, absolutely. Seems to me, of course, the problem is, I don't know of any Bible verse that nails it. What we have are different hints throughout. For example, we have Acts uh, 7 when Stephen is getting stoned, and he looks up. Do you remember that passage? He looks up into the heavens, and what does he see? He sees Jesus, and Jesus stands up for him. He stands up for him. And that's the idea, is, of course, that he's already enthroned, and that's why he's standing up for him. And maybe you don't remember this, so let me just... I'll just read this part to you. It's in Acts 7, uh, 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked intently toward heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and they stoned him and killed him. And he said, Lord, receive my spirit and so forth. So that's one example. And there are other examples of people believing probably in worship, probably in prayer, that he wasn't just resurrected, but that he actually is reigning as Lord. And so the appropriate response is to worship him as such. And again, it's just assumed in the text. It, it really is assumed all the time. Paul assumes it, like in Philippians 2, whether he wrote the hymn or not, when he says that, that of course, he, he verse Philippians 2, 6 and following, when Christ emptied himself, he humbled himself, uh, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. As a result, God exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every name will bow, knee will bow, heaven and earth under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This name above all names seems to be that he, he received the identity of Lord, or to use the Hebrew word, Yahweh. He received the identity of that, that kind of authority. And because of that, Every tongue will confess he is Lord. Now, if you grew up a Christian, we've said that so much, it doesn't sound special. Well, I will get yeah, he's the Lord. But again, if, you, if anybody today, but also if you're a first century Jew, to say that Jesus is now reigning Lord is absolutely new. Hurtado likes to say it this way, it is a mutation. I go farther than that and say, man, this is crazy. Moses was never considered Lord. Abraham was never considered Lord. I mean, it's It's amazing. Uh, and that with that came all kinds of beliefs that Jesus was, again, not just resurrected, but he received this lordship. Oh, he says it like this in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1.20, Paul says, This power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. And God put all things under Christ's feet. And he gave him to the church as head over all things. Now the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I could go verse after verse after verse of these kinds of things in the New Testament that demonstrate that the earliest Christians thought Jesus was risen Lord. The question is, why do they think that? So I guess reiterate one more time. It does seem to me that in their religious experiences, probably at Pentecost, probably at the Ascension, probably in worship as the Spirit spoke to them and prophecies, uh, probably in visions, visions like what Stephen had in Acts chapter 7, these visions of him seeing the Lord up there. And I suspect it's all these things combined together. On top of that, and I think Hurtado would agree with this, I don't remember now in his literature, but he probably would agree. On top of that, it seems to have been the case that the historical Jesus really did see himself as the Son of Man figure 
coming on the clouds and reigning over. So Jesus primed the pump. He had been saying things like this in his ministry for quite some time. And then in the resurrection experiences and the Holy Spirit experiences, experiences in the church, it really happened. And they came to believe that he was ruling Lord. And so the only appropriate response was to pray to him, to write songs to him as Lord, to baptize in his name, to heal in his name, uh, to, to cite Old Testament scripture verses that clearly refer to Yahweh, but now use that name to refer to Jesus. Now, the earliest Christians did not believe Jesus was Yahweh. They did not believe that. They, were, they, were, they did not believe that. They were monotheists. They were not modalists. But they, mean, they use that in a way to express the belief that Jesus possessed the same kind of deity, you might say, or God, God-like kind that God the Father shared. And I'll end on this just to, to say more because I just it's one of my favorite passages and it proves the point very well. Uh, it's another way of saying it. The author of Hebrews says it this way in Hebrews 1, 1 and following. After God spoke long ago in various portions and various ways to our ancestors through the prophets, in these last days he has spoken to us in a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he created the world. Now well, listen to that, he's the agent of creation. It's the same thing Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Uh, he was, he's, the, he's the agent of creation. Verse 3, the son, I like this translation from the NET, I think it's good. The Son is the radiance of His glory and the representation of His essence. And He sustains all things by His powerful Word. And so when He had accomplished cleansing for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. Thus He became so far better than the angels as He inherited a name superior to theirs. And then He goes on for a while. That is indicative of New Testament theology. That Jesus is not just a dude. He's not just resurrected and very special like that. He's special because he's resurrected and because he is the reigning Lord. And it's and this, both of those together that make the earliest disciples worship Jesus. Not that he was resurrected, but he was resurrected and given the place of authority in the name of all, of all names and subject, all things are subject to him. Well, I hope that helps, brother. Keep up the good work. I hope you enjoy the Hurtado's podcast and uh, keep your questions coming. God bless you. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom and also look at my twitter feed at glimpse the king or at dr d pendergrass at dr d pendergrass there's tons of ways reached out i hope you will send me your questions send me your comments if you'd like to support the ministries of glimpse of the kingdom you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com if you'd like for me to come and do some consulting check out my website davidpendergrassconsulting.com And I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.